8 minutes and 46 seconds. That's how long a police officer knelt on the neck of George Floyd, ignoring his desperate pleas, I can't breathe, until he died. I tried to watch the horrific video, but found it too upsetting to finish. For this was not an isolated incident, it was only the latest exposure of the dark underbelly of America's struggles with racism and the lingering shadow of slavery. Also the sin of slavery is part of our colonial history here in Britain. That's why recently we have seen mass protests breaking out in the streets, historic statues of people associated with slavery being torn down, and classic television shows being censored due to their racial insensitivities. It's against that background that we're asking tonight's question. Does the Bible condone slavery? Now tonight we were pre-scheduled to be studying a passage in the Bible called Ephesians chapter 6 and it begins with these words. Slaves, obey your earthly masters. And so at first glance it would appear the answer is yes, the Bible does condone slavery. But before we start wondering if the Bible should be censored or banned, if statues of crosses should be torn down, churches boarded up, we need to realise that the writer of this letter, the Apostle Paul, lived during a time when more than half of the Roman Empire's population were slaves. Paul here is not defending or legitimising the institution of slavery. He is simply addressing the fact that it exists and recognising that the tiny Christian community will be unable to remodel the entire way of life across the empire. Instead, Paul explains what they can do, which is model a countercultural way of life within the Christian household. That's why in these verses, Paul reassures the Christian slave that they possess a newfound dignity. No matter how menial their job or social status, they now have the high privilege of serving a heavenly master. Verse seven and eight says, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do whether they are slave or free. He's saying they can take pride. Just as if you were the lowliest servant in Buckingham Palace, you'd be able to take pride in the fact that you worked for the Queen. So also these Christian slaves, they work for God. At the same time, Paul warns the masters of Christian households that God will hold them accountable for how they treat their servants. Verse 9, And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favouritism with him. This was revolutionary stuff at the time. In fact, the letters of Paul undermined the foundations on which slavery was built. Paul lit the long fuse that would later destroy slavery for centuries in Europe. Later, after the revival of the slave trade in Europe, Paul's letters inspired the work of the abolitionist William Wilberforce. To tackle ignorance and rehumanize slaves in people's minds, Wilberforce printed posters like this bearing the caption, Am I not a man and a brother? Those words were inspired by Paul's letter to Philemon, which encouraged him to treat his runaway slave converted under Paul's ministry as no longer a slave, but better than a slave, as a beloved brother. If you consider me a partner, receive him as you would receive me. Elsewhere in his letters, Paul wrote about equality in the church. He says, there is no slave, there is no free, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. Similarly today, we live 20 centuries after Paul, and we believe that everyone should be treated equally, fairly, decently. That's why we object to slavery. But the question we have to consider is, where did those ideas come from? You see, we didn't get them from the Greeks or the Romans. Aristotle observed that since people had differing natural abilities, some people were in essence born to be tools and others were born to be kings. The idea that all men and women or that all races were equal, that was ludicrous. And so what changed? Well, it's because we live in a society that has been revolutionised by Christianity. On the very first page of the Bible, it declares that all human beings have been made in the image of God, sharing equally in glory and dignity in the sight of God. That's why the secular sociologist Rodney Stark has written, Of all the world's religions, including the three great monotheisms, only in Christianity did the idea develop that slavery was sinful and must be abolished. Slavery was once nearly universal to all societies able to afford it. 
Only in the West did significant moral opposition ever arise and lead to abolition. I believe it's just so important that we recognise the history of the positive influence of Christianity on our society here in the Western world, especially if we're going to seek to tackle racial injustice and inequalities that persist today. It is the teachings of the Bible that has helped, have helped us come this far, and I believe the biblical worldview still has the resources to help us go further still. That's why the celebrated civil rights activist, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, famously preached that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. I believe the Bible, he said. However, as our society moves further away from the biblical worldview, I fear that we are not moving towards justice, but towards the abyss. Let me explain why. By comparing tonight the secular worldview and the biblical worldview, especially as they relate to these current racial issues in our society. Let's look first of all at the secular worldview. We, if, if, if it had hashtags, it would be perhaps no lives matter or at very best, some lives matter more than others. The worldview of secular humanism is based upon the rejection of all supernatural deities and religious beliefs. If you read the definition on the British Humanist website, you will see that they believe that this life in this world is all there is. And they say that we should work to make it as good as possible for everyone. Many humanists are wonderful people. They work hard to do good in our society. Nevertheless, at the level of ideas, there is a significant problem for the secular worldview. In it, human beings are reduced to being blobs of carbon floating from one meaningless existence to another. Our lives are the blink of an eye in cosmic time. The whole history of human achievements is destined for the abyss of nothingness in the cold solar death of the solar system. Ultimately, no lives matter. Or as I said earlier, at best, only some lives matter. For example, take Charles Darwin, who famously made atheism intellectually respectable. I wonder, do you know the full title of Charles Darwin's world-changing book, The Origin of the Species? Well, here it is. The preservation of favoured races in the struggle for life. This caused a controversy a few years ago whenever Darwin's face was printed on banknotes for the first time. Many people pointed out that his atheistic evolutionary idea of the survival of the fittest applied to human society had been used to justify racist and eugenic policies in the last century, bringing misery and death to many. That's also why the atheist journalist Douglas Murray wrote an article entitled Would Human Life Be Sacred in an Atheist World? His conclusion was no, especially not at the extremities of life for the unborn and the elderly. You see, the secular humanistic worldview does not possess the resources to support our convictions about the dignity and equality of all human beings. Instead, the secular historian Tom Holland has recognised, much to his own shock and surprise, that these values were in fact borrowed from Christianity. He writes in his recent important book, Dominion, that human beings have rights, that they are born equal, that they are owed sustenance and shelter and refuge from persecution. These were never self-evident truths. He continues, the wellspring of humanist values lay not in reason, not in evidence-based thinking, but in history. The revolution preached by St. Paul. Had it been otherwise, then no one would ever have got woke. This is the fruit of our Christian heritage, the biblical worldview. The dilemma for our society today is, can the fruit survive without that root? Can the plant survive being transplanted into a different soil which is acidically opposed to the biblical worldview? That's where we are today. The different soil is called critical theory. Although you may not have heard of it, you will have witnessed the revolutionary changes that it's brought about in our society over the last 20 years. Indeed, critical theory is the philosophy of the Black Lives Matter organisation. The central tenet of critical theory is that we don't need God for ultimate meaning or morality. Instead, we can invent purpose for ourselves. We can become good people by working for social justice. Critical theory views the world through the glasses and the lens of power. It divides society into two groups. 
the oppressors, privileged groups, and the oppressed, disadvantaged groups. For example, there's racial oppression between white and non-white people. There's sexual oppression between male and female, the patriarchy. There's heteronormative oppression, heterosexuals against homosexuals. There's gender oppression, cisgender, that's binary gender versus transgender, fluid gender. Critical theory advocates for liberation through the reversal of power, the redistribution of resources away from the dominant group and a restructuring of society for the benefit of the minority group. Rather than fulfilling Martin Luther King's vision of his children one day not being judged by the colour of their skin, but rather by the content of their character, instead in critical theory, people are defined and judged by what groups they identify with. For example, one critical race theorist, Robin DiAngelo, wrote in her best-selling book, Right Fragili White Fragility, no individual member of a dominant group has to do anything specific to oppress a member of the minority group. We must challenge the dominant conceptualization of racism as individual acts that only some bad individuals do, rather than as a system in which we all are implicated. Reading her book, I was left feeling condemned for enjoying unearned and unjust privileges as a white, heterosexual, able-bodied, cisgendered man. Now let me say, I believe that critical theory is seeing things. It makes valid observations of our world, but I believe that its interpretation of these things and its proposed solutions can go so far as to say I believe that they're dangerous. I believe that there are at least two significant problems with it. The first problem is I believe it's dangerous to divide the world into groups like good people versus bad people, especially when you then assign guilt, moral guilt, to those groups. For example, to say like D'Angelo that all white people are essentially racist. They are part of a racist system, regardless of what they think or say or do themselves as individuals. It may be really comforting to think that all the goodness in the world is in you and attaches to your group, that all the badness in the world is in your enemies, attaches to them. But when you divide society into groups competing for power against a common enemy, you don't get reconciliation that way. Instead, you just perpetuate resentment. Interestingly, that's why Martin Luther King believed in nonviolent protest. He once preached, hate begets hate. We must meet the forces of hate with the power of love. Our aim must never be to defeat or humiliate the white man, but to win his friendship and understanding. He understood that racial reconciliation is only going to be possible when we recognise our common humanity, that we are all God's children. That's the first problem of critical theory. The second problem is critical theory fails to recognise that the oppressed can also be oppressors. I've appreciated how that truth is depicted in the popular novel and recent BBC drama Knots and Crosses. In it, Mallory Blackman imagines that Europe has been colonised by Africa, its white population enslaved, and in her alternative 20th century the knots, the people with lighter skin tone, they are segregated and oppressed by the crosses, those with darker skin tone. It's a fascinating portrayal of the fact that all of us possess the capacity to oppress other people, that there is no virtue or vice attached to skin colour, that a different social structure is no guarantee of ending oppression. Instead, the fact that we all possess the natural capacity for oppressing others. Just go look at a school playground, you'll see it in action. That capacity, that inbuilt instinctive capacity is evidence that there is something wrong much deeper in the human condition. And the Bible talks about that, it calls it sin. Critical theory cannot address sin. Critical theory cannot change the human heart, the human condition. But God's Son, Jesus Christ, can. And so let's move on from thinking about the secular worldview to think about the biblical worldview. And the hashtag here would be Black Lives Matter because all lives matter to God. You see, in the biblical worldview, there are three truths that help bridge the many divisions between people in this world. The first thing is creation. 
On the very first page of the Bible, God tells us that human beings are not cosmic accidents. Rather, every one of us has a maker who has lovingly made us in his image. Although we talk about different races, in reality, there is only one race, the human race. And it is full of diversity in all sorts of ways. That's what enabled Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King to once preach. There are no gradations in the image of God. Every man from treble white to bass black is significant in God's keyboard, precisely because every man is made in the image of God. And of course, we would add to that every woman too. The Bible enables us to declare that black lives matter because all lives matter to God, from the womb to the tomb. And we are obligated to love, respect and value everyone who bears and shares in that image too. But creation isn't the only thing that unites us all together. There's a second thing, and that is sin. You see, unfortunately, the human race has spurned the love of God, our maker. Not content to live as the image of God, we have attempted to become our own gods, ruling over our little kingdoms of self. The root of racism is a sinful pride and a selfish love for ourselves, which leads us to harbour prejudice, mistrust, even hatred against those who are different to us. Sinful people can create sinful structures that then oppress other people. And let's be absolutely clear, there are unjust sinful structures in our society today. Just listen to to the lived experience of Rennie Edo Lodge in her book, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. When someone is being treated differently or unfairly because of an innate characteristic like their ethnicity, their skin colour, their gender, That is sinful. And any such unjust structures which are perpetuating that sin, they should be challenged. They should be reformed. However, the ultimate solution to racial injustice requires going much deeper to address sin in the human heart. It also requires going much higher because sin is not just an offence against another human being. It is also an offence against the living God in whose image that person has been made. And God in his justice is committed to destroy all evil, including racism. That takes us then to the third unifying theme of the Bible. And that that, that is redemption. The Bible introduces us to the God who once rescued his people Israel from slavery in Egypt. And later came in the person of Jesus Christ to rescue the human race from its greatest oppressors, sin and sin's consequence, death. And that's why the word redemption, it's drawn from the slave market. It's the price paid to set a slave free. The gospel of Jesus Christ turns critical theory on its head. The God who possessed supreme power emptied himself in love to liberate the human race from its captivity to sin. That's why elsewhere in Philippians chapter 2, Paul writes, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who... Being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, a slave, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus, through his death on the cross, has paid the redemption price to set us free. He has suffered the penalty that our sins deserve. He's paid it in full. And then history records how Jesus rose again triumphantly from the dead. And his resurrection demonstrates that he is God, that he is the source of life, that he can give new life, that he can give you a new heart, that he can cleanse You from the worst stains of sin, including prejudice, partiality, racism and sectarianism. I grew up in a sectarian society. I need Jesus to cleanse my heart of that sin. And maybe tonight you need to ask Jesus to deal with those sins in your heart for the first time. Then, like the former slave trader John Newton, you can sing, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Because that's what it truly means to get woke. Jesus doesn't just change the hearts of individuals either. He creates communities. 
Today, Christianity is the most diverse and multi-ethnic movement in all of history. The great untold story of the last century is the explosion of Christianity in the two-thirds world, in Africa, Latin America, Asia. And that explains why the Bible finishes with a vision of people from every nation, tribe, tongue and language worshipping together before God. And today the local church should be a preview of that future day. A countercultural community that shows that peace and harmony is possible between all people and all races without the solutions of critical theory. It has to be said that sometimes in the past the church has failed to live up to this high and holy calling to faithfully represent Jesus to the world. And for that we must seek God's grace for forgiveness, his grace to change. For example, we can learn from presentations like the recent popular video, Racism and the Church in the UK. This interesting panel discussion um, shares and suggests ways that we could do better as a church, helping people of different cultures and ethnicities to feel welcome inviting them to share their stories and experiences and releasing them to use their God-given gifts and talents to bless the church, to further God's work and kingdom. There's some good lessons here for us to be thinking about and chewing over in Corrubbers. But that's how the biblical worldview has a better set of solutions than the ones proposed in the secular worldview, especially by critical theory. So I want to finish by just quickly telling you about the autobiography of Tom Tarrant. It's entitled Consumed by Hate, Redeemed by Love. In the 1960s, Tom was a terrorist belonging to one of the most violent branches of the Ku Klux Klan. He was seriously wounded in a police shootout after attempting to bomb a civil rights activist and a critic of the Klan. But in prison, his heart and mind was transformed when he experienced the love and the power of Jesus. And since then, he has worked tirelessly against racism and prejudice in America. And he finishes his book with three practical responses to this topic. Three suggestions of things that we could do. The first thing he says is pray to God to give you insight into any sinful attitudes or prejudices or partiality that's lurking in your heart against people who are different to you. Secondly, he suggests that you read for truth and perspective about the history of race in our country and that we listen to the experiences of ethnic minorities. And thirdly, he suggests that we reach out for friendship with someone from a different culture, someone of a different ethnicity, to love them and to build a meaningful, honest friendship. These are ways, practical ways, that each of us could begin to make a difference to make our society a better place for everyone, regardless of the colour of their skin. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to move into a time of questions shortly. You can go on to the website slido.com. Just use our event code number 32803. Post your questions, see what other questions people have asked. And uh, let's have some fun now doing that.